Housing 2.0. This is session two of our six virtual sessions that examines how to consistently optimize five key housing, key housing user experiences. Now, today's car is anticipated design session, formally titled Optimizing Design for Lower Cost High Performance Homes. So, some of the strategies you look today will help you provide a better product at a lower cost. In fact, I'm so confident in that statement. It's actually why we're holding this session during International Expect Success Month. Yes, my name is Mike Kalignan. I am the Housing 2.0 Program Manager. Now, if at any point you have questions, please don't hesitate to reach out to me via the chat box or by email, and I'll put that email address in the chat box in just a little while. You know who else expects success? Sam Rashkin. He's formerly the Chief Architect at DOE's Building Technologies Office, but he is now focused on creating and teaching the content for the Housing 2.0 program. That content is based largely on Sam's latest book, Housing 2.0, A Disruption Survival Guide. The full program was established to help empower you, our building professionals, to design and construct higher performance, healthier, healthier more sustainable homes at a fraction of the cost. Now, Sam's gonna lead us through today's seminar and he's also gonna address your questions <clears throat> at the end. Before we get started, I need to tell you about our successful sponsors. The first is Schneider Electric, who is driving the digital transformation of modern homes with smart and sustainable energy solutions for ultimate comfort and energy efficiency. Their connected home ecosystem of smart energy management solutions provides digital control of energy use throughout a home, from the grid by their smart electrical panel to their connected wiring devices. Next, we have Jinko Solar. They are a leading PV module manufacturer and energy storage system integrator. The company has deployed more than 100 gigawatts of their Eagle modules in 160 countries globally, including more than 17 gigawatts right here in the United States. Eagle Storage brings together the best energy storage technology for turnkey hardware and energy storage services. And we're gonna hear a little bit more about Jinko from Ben later in the seminar. Now we also have Mitsubishi Electric. Mitsubishi Electric promotes sustainable building through the electrification of residential and commercial heating and cooling products. Their mission is to advance technologies that reduce energy efficiency and eliminate dependence on fossil fuels. And finally, we have Panasonic Healthy Indoor Living Solutions. They're helping builders across the country differentiate themselves with powerful, code compliant, and cost effective indoor air quality solutions that provide a safer environment for home buyers. Now, during the course of today's presentation, you can submit questions for Sam. Use that questions box I referenced earlier. It's inside the GoToWebinar control panel. I'm going to review those questions and pose them to Sam after his presentation. And now, here's a guy who expects you all to have success after attending these sessions, Mr. Sam Rashkin. Hey, thank you so much, Mike. And like Mike, I could not be more grateful for our sponsors, Mitsubishi Electric, Panasonic, Jinko Solar, and Schneider Electric. And welcome, everyone. This is our second module or in the series of uh, 2024. And we're going to talk today about optimizing the design user experience. And the goal always for me is to get lower cost, high performance homes. In effect, make the high performance housing professionals industry leaders. What we will cover today Uh, is first the context. Uh, Housing 2.0 uh, provides a user experience optimization process and strategy that I think is critical for all high performance home builders. We have to do better with less. And then we'll jump into optimizing the design user experience. We'll go into best practices. In the middle of that, we'll introduce Jinko Solar. Then we'll come back and wrap up the best practices and move on to the design user experience where we apply the best practices and show how the numbers can add up. And the numbers add up to pretty substantial figures. So let's jump right in. And as Mike mentioned at the end, we will have a discussion. So first context for the Housing 2.0 user optimization. And it all begins with this key data point, which is where we look at how time is spent every day for adults in this country. Uh, we spend about well, we spend time in our homes, at work, dining, outdoors, vehicles. And the key thing is this point, that nearly 70% of our time is spent in our homes. Homes, in fact, are where life happens. And probably post-COVID happens even more. I would estimate maybe 70, 75%, at least of our time, as more and more work at home. So this brings us to the why for housing 2.0. 
our core reason for existing is homes where life happens better. Now, what we do is we start with this uh, uh, audience that we attract, normally high performance home builders, and we try to build on that uh, performance um, experience that we provide so well once we're in any number of different programs. And the, what, the way we do that is look at kind of the whole housing experience as a system. In addition to performance, there's the design of the home, the community, the sales, the quality. In fact, uh, these five strategies entail about 160 best practices that we go over and believe consistent, consistently deliver better user experience for lower cost. So this is what we do and with Housing 2.0 and how we get there is a process for getting consistent results. And generally what we're doing we have this contrasting business model. The first cost is a typical business model for most builders, and we'd like to transition to a user experience optimization business model. And the first step in making that happen is to realize we spend um, often as little as we can for experts and special features in a first cost business model. And what we want to do is invest in user experience, experts and special features for sure things. Those are features and experts solutions that can transform the homeowner's living experience in that home. If we know we have a sure thing, let's make those investments. The key part is next part is we normally have an array of costs for material, labor, marketing, and sales that we can substantially reduce if we optimize value. And just the way we want high performance homes to be efficient and lean, we want the same from every aspect of what we do building a home. Simple, lean, quality, integrated systems, mass customization, all offer huge opportunities for cost savings. And that shows up as a net reduced cost and because the experiences are better added value. And the whole concept here at the end is to translate the value of a better home for lower cost. And that includes sales and services. So that's the basic context of what we do. And I'll, we highlight a lot of empirical results in uh, Housing 2.0 book. Um, and this is one example where uh, Walsh Construction uh, built one building on a site apartment project and then built the second with UX optimization. And they were able, just for the user experience optimization part, to get a 24% reduction in their cost. And so the key resource for doing all this is our book, Housing 2.0, A Disruption Survival Guide. Uh, you can get it by just copying this uh, code on your camera, it'll take you to how to order it. But this is the basic reference for this program. It includes over 400 pages. It goes into detail about the five user experience optimization strategies, including 160 plus best practices, has hundreds of graphics, uh, over 360 citations, um, amazing guest expert essays from friends across all these disciplines, and it's gone through five years of vet vetting before being uh, rewritten from the original source material, retooling the U.S. housing industry. So again, if you can take a picture of this code, you can get access to the book. Now let's jump into the best practices. And as I usually do in the Housing 2.0 references, I lay out frameworks for this basic construct. Why? What is the core purpose for that? Uh, for, for the user experience? What are the user experience optimization goals? And what are the strategies? And why? we optimize design is because how you live matters. Again, respecting this sobering statistic that we're in our homes 70% of our lives, how you live outside, inside, and deep, all the details make so much difference. And what do we do to get there, to deliver on this why, is first we optimize the location, and we do that by fitting to site. Then we optimize nature, these free resources just for the taking that are surround us every day, and we do that with natural comfort. Then we optimize space, and we do that with right sizing, optimize form with simple, finally optimize function with integrated systems. So jumping into the first strategy, fit the site, there are four key first tier best practices, and then there are granular, more detailed best practices. You'll notice at the top ribbon, we kind of have a kind of a way of locating where we are at every step of the way. Here we are at fit the site. And optimizing views is uh, about both design views and natural views. 
Optimized drainage is really about optimizing topography that's grading, siding, and setback from slopes to managing water and erosion. I'm not going to go into too much more detail. I think a lot of the reference material in the book is there for this topic. Optimizing materials is about respecting the damage function forces acting on any specific location. So in cold climates, we want to manage freeze thaw resistance. In coastal climates with a lot of salt air, we want to manage corrosion resistance. In very hot climates, we want to manage ultraviolet or UV resistance. And in warm climates, we also want to manage uh, uh, pest damage. So we have that with pest resistance. Again, this one I'm not going to spend too much more time on. And then the fourth strategy, or the fourth high tier best practice is optimize connection. We do that with the rear or recessive garages, garages, front porches, and landscaping instead of fencing for markets where they feel that's a possibility. Now, I start with get the site with an iconic piece of architecture. Uh, most people recognize this home from Frank Lloyd Wright's Falling Water in Mill Run, Pennsylvania, Eastern Highlands. And without question, it's just a remarkable, remarkable piece of architecture. I'm going to suggest it's not a remarkable, remarkable home. Uh, so much so that it can't even function as a home anymore. Uh, the costs and maintenance on this home, which functions almost like a snow collector in one of the regions with the most snowfall in the continental U.S., just doesn't allow it to function like a home. It's just tremendous amount of cost and repairs go into it. You know, the freeze thaw that happens with the snow that sits on these huge balconies. And I'll also mention that um, you know, the balconies also block a lot of the view that's so in incredibly impressive. In fact, here's an in inside shot of the uh, falling water, and you can see low ceilings, big overhangs, and very quickly the amazing views compressed to are unfortunately not an impressive outcome. And again, you can see lots of wasted space and dark colors. So I'll go and take the risk of suggesting this is an amazing piece of architecture that just blew away the potential for what concrete could do at the time, but it's not a home that's fit the site. And it functions mostly like a museum where all the lovers for Frank Lloyd Wright have a mecca kind of experience to go and visit this home. So let's jump into the first key most important priority in all the best practices we have for design, and that's to optimize views. And without question, you know, we talk about in the planning process, you want to lay out your site so you leverage as much natural view opportunity with the most number of units as you can. So when you have natural views, the design then should follow through and optimize those views. If there are no natural views, here's why I suggest you're not off the hook. You need to optimize design views to create um, views with the way the home is positioned and set in the site in your architecture. So this is the top priority. And once uh, uh, you do that, then you have to optimize the landscaping and hardscaping if it's a design view to kind of follow through. And I'll suggest landscape architecture trumps home architecture. As a recovering architect, this is something I've come to realize. So this picture makes it evident that when you have a, a compelling view, you have to do everything to leverage it. And it could be water, vistas, of cityscapes, green spaces, any of those types of uh, views all should be optimized. Now, when you don't have a view, then you have to design a view. And here's where I, again, want to suggest landscaping architecture trumps uh, building architecture. You, you can see the before and after how much the architecture is sub, sub, uh, it's secondary to the landscape of, of the whole home. That's how powerful the landscape architecture is. So the design view is basically two options. No, most builders don't want to do the landscaping. I understand that. So you can at least um, offer an upgrade as one option and have the model home if you're a bigger builder show options for landscaping that could be um, expertly done and uh, provided as part of the uh, cost of the home. And if that's too a bridge too far, you can always provide expert landscaping plans where you leverage really great expert designs that maybe two or three that can be chosen from, and the homeowners have some adult supervision so things go right. You know, there's so much that goes into really expert landscaping. 
that most of us uh, lay homeowners don't have. So here's an option where you may offer a landscaping option like this, or instead you may offer a landscape design that specifies the bushes, the hardscapings, the trees, um, and it's all laid out to accommodate outdoor living furniture and, uh, and amenities like a hot tub, whatever it may be. So uh, the key thing here is, again, where experts make the difference. They understand turf type and how much turf should be there, the amount. They understand the difference with shrubs and spacing, ground cover opportunities, trees type and spacings, and how much they drop or don't drop, hardscaping, outdoor living. This is just you know, insanely important skill to have. And since we're not trained for this, most homeowners don't have it. Okay, we have a lot of building types where this could be a challenge, and this is one townhomes. Um, I, I just took a Google Earth image from a townhome uh, in the region where I live. And just to show you that basically in front of the townhome, you're just looking out at a parking lot in the back, you have a postage, postage stamp backyard. Now, what it looks like conceptually is there is a might be five or six townhouses in a row. You have these backyards that are postage stamp size in the back. Again, the front's parking. So the typical plan is minimal view because it's, it's just a very narrow part of the back. Uh, minimal outdoor linkage because, again, poor, uh, uh, the poor plan has very little uh, view of the back and therefore very little access to the, to the outdoor space. And then because it's so long and narrow, has minimal daylight and minimal minimal privacy we're on two story townhomes people can look into one another person's yard from the second story windows so this is the least optimized configuration and it winds up looking like this uh, I, I snuck and I took a picture of one of the townhomes in our region and you know it's just going to be a throwaway space it's hardly used and it's it's it, you can see the lack of privacy the lack of view the lack of access and daylight and so it's just it's just, it's just something that's almost a wasted space. Now you can offer solutions, and you can see how transformative expert solutions are. So you do have a good view from whatever rooms are off this backyard, but you have minimal linkage because there's so few rooms off the back, minimal access and daylight, and minimal privacy. So this is kind of the way you, you say a view is a high priority in my design strategy. An L-shaped townhouse seems to solve a lot of these challenges. Uh, one, we can repurpose the yards that we're no longer using, so we can have equivalent number of units. In this case, we went from six to four, and on our site plan, we can find with all this extra space that's not being used for backyards, we can find additional space for the extra units, so we're we have the same number of units. But now we have the good view, plus we have optimized outdoor linkage, access, daylight, and privacy. Let me show you how. Uh, on the side facing the courtyard on your neighbor, the no windows, that's the quiet side, so you have privacy. And then you have this huge exposure now on the floor plan to the courtyard. So you have optimum outdoor linkage, optimum access, optimum daylight, in what normally is a building type that doesn't have those and because of, again, the quiet side, optimum privacy. And then the secret sauce here is the center entry, because that gives you a full room up front and a full front porch, and you don't have to walk through them to get to the entry. And so that works amazingly well. Digging and researching found a project in uh, the uh, Pike Road, Alabama, the waters, and here you can see the exact uh, design strategy being employed, where you have full, front porch, you have the full room in front, you have the entry in the middle of the courtyard. You know, it's amazing how well it works. Here's the actual project. The one big disappointment for me was the courtyards. I went recently and found a home unit was for sale. And this is the first time I ever saw a picture of the courtyards. And I crossed off optimized view here because courtyards could do so much better. Here's an example, much more expertly designed courtyards. And again, I'll always tell you, in the hands of the experts, landscaping and hardscaping, it's, it's just transformative. So it, it, I always try to encourage that's a great investment to make. Uh, when we get to community connection, uh, you know, our typical uh, two-car garage or three-car car garage dominated front elevation results in no community connection. You can just 
tell looking at this one project that the the whole uh, the whole experience uh, in terms of the community street walking and neighbors and so forth is so diminished in contrast to when we actually have communities that are designed for connection. And uh, one study from the World Health Organization points to all the social connect connectedness benefits for deep disease prevention, lower rates of anxiety, stronger immune systems, improved cognitive function. You know, but it's all it, it's all kind of intuitive when you see these neighborhoods. You know they live healthier. Another study done uh, uh, quantified 50% uh, better chance of staying healthy and increased long longevity. And that study included over 300,000 participants. Uh, it's one of the medical journal studies. So a connection is a huge impact on how we live. And the best practices, again, are recessive garages, rear garages, front porch, and views to the street. So uh, essentially, uh, this is something we have to design in from the very beginning when we lay out communities and then execute when we design the home. Moving to natural comfort with tabbing across the top, um, we understood the power of all nature resources around us over a thousand years ago. And this is an example here with cliff dwellings, Mesa Verde, Colorado, where uh, the native Indians would uh, find a cliff facing south, build the homes with adobe, thermal mass, and let the sun just bake them in the winter because this low sun would come pouring in and it would heat the spaces directly in the thermal mass. So at night, that big thermal battery would provide all these warm surfaces, making it feel cozy at night. And during the summer, the high sun would be shaded completely by the cliff. And uh, the night, uh, diurnal swings at night were so, low, the temperatures were so low that you, again, the thermal battery was working to provide air conditioning during the day. All this year round natural comfort with no electrons, no natural gas, it was just incredible. And today, when we build in the desert, like in Las Vegas, this is a city center. We're building buildings where essentially, if there was a power failure, you would die within hours. You know, the excessive heat and without the, without the mechanical brute force systems to save us, we die in buildings without the power. Uh, amazing, a thousand years of how much we've regressed in, in, in just the power of natural resources that enhance how we live. So there are uh, four key uh, best practices for natural comfort, and they're optimized natural heating, natural cooling, natural lighting, natural fresh air, and they all use uh, some portion of all of uh, six key more granular best practices, solar orientation, solar shading, thermal mass storage, prevailing breeze orientation, prevailing breeze capture, and cool roofs. I'll go through some of these as much as I can in the time frame we have today, but it's obvious when you see uh, uh, a building designed for nature that doesn't have glare, how much more view and daylight and comfort you have compared to when we don't design for it, we're forced to close the blinds all day on the right. And you know, we, we build this whole capability with all these windows and we lose all the benefits because we don't design for nature. Uh, same thing in terms of just orientation. Uh, this is a study done in California, and it looked at just how much impact having a home space south would, re, uh, would have on the heating and cooling costs. And it was 25% effective free heating and cooling. Um, it varies from coastal to inland climates, but it's just there for the taking. If we only have top of mind when we lay out communities to optimize east-west streets so the homes face north-south north, south, perpendicular to the street and then design for them with good designs. Uh, a great thing that happens with thermal mass is it stirs the heat so at night you feel cozy and during the day you don't overheat. Mean radiant temperature, which is the temperature of the surfaces around us, has 40% greater impact on perceived comfort than ambient air temperature. It's transformative in terms of comfort. And then natural light is, we all know, we feel better with natural light. Even our pets know to just embrace daylight and sit by the windows and 
screen doors. It boosts vitamin D, wards off seasonal depression, improves sleep, enhances productivity. So huge benefits, but people don't even need to know the science. Everyone knows they like daylight. And we see a room on the left where we design with nature and we allow uh, 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 glare-free uh, light to come through with proper shading and overhangs and so forth. How much different it is from the room on the right where we have to pull down the blinds because we don't design for nature. 98% of home builders, designers, and net architects scored natural light, a top home feature in 2022, which amazed me because I've, I've been beating this drum for decades and it's great to see it come to light. No pun intended. Okay, natural comfort, fresh air, uh, also contributes tremendous amount to wellness, uh, eliminates stale air, removes dust, better concentration, better health. Again, all these scientific studies just always just show when you connect to nature, you have better living experience. So the key thing for me about this, all these experiences, glare-free views, free heating, cooling, <laughs> superior comfort, <laughs> again, with uh, by managing the mean radiant temperature, a natural light, fresh air, and then the resilience, our, our, our spaces can actually float without brute force, mechanical uh, elect, uh, f uh, equipment, electricity, natural gas equipment. All that's for <coughs> worth tens of thousands. I'm sorry. All that's worth tens of thousands of dollars. That's my estimated value. But I'll tell you, just the energy savings over 30 years will come out to about twenty-five to forty thousand dollars. So it's a pretty safe estimate from my uh, from my perch. So here are these tens of thousands of dollars of value just sitting there, and the cost to get to natural heating, natural cooling, natural fresh air, natural lighting is zero. The biggest objection I get from builders why they don't take advantage of this is they don't want to bother because they can't control the lots they get. Many of them build either for clients or they build <clears throat> they build for uh, developers where they're given the lots. And what I always try to explain is by probability, 25% of your lots are within shooting distance of south for the real elevation. 25% of the lots are within shooting distance of south for the front elevation. And then 50% of the lots will face east or west. That's just probability. So as it uh, as it's just a, a, a great opportunity, why not have standard design strategies or solutions ready for the 50% of the lots you have that you'll get that have either south-facing front or south-facing rear, rear. And the way you apply these uh, best practices, again, are orientation, thermal mass, or natural heating. Uh, all of these best practices for natural cooling for fresh air, prevailing breeze orientation, and prevailing breeze capture, which is nothing more than saying you have windows facing the prevailing cool breezes, particularly at night in Western climates. And then you actually think about how your window openings work and how you use, let's say, casement windows and which side you have them open to to optimize the capture and flow through a room. And then on natural lighting, it's orientation and shading. And the shading, so you don't have the glare free, you don't have the glare effect that forces you to pull down the blinds and, and negate the natural lighting. I'll just run through this just a little bit to see why these work. Uh, if you look at the arc for the um, sun in the summer, it rises in the northeast and uh, <clears throat> sets in the northwest. In the winter, and it's very high in the sky, in the winter, it rises in the southeast and it sets in the southwest and it's very low in the sky. So the south orientation optimizes the access to the sun and optimizes control because it's highest most of the day on the south and overhangs can block it. East-west orientation minimizes access. You only get a few hours in the morning at night and minimizes control because it's so low in the sky. There's almost nothing you can do short of having some mechanical blinds or something like that. And north orientation is only diffuse light. So this is what we want to do is 
optimize east-west streets with north and south facing homes, pay tens of thousands of dollars of superior user experience value and utility savings of tens of thousands of dollars just from the orientation benefit. The, when I say have the standard designs ready for the south facing lots, for one where it's the south facing the front yard, <clears throat> you might want to consider a sawtooth design as a way to get the uh, sunlight to the back of the house where most people live. And then thermal mass is a way to, again, have that battery, thermal battery to store and avoid overheating, even in the winter, and let those heat come out at night. And then again, overhangs are critical to effectively control the sunlight and mitigate the glare. If you have a backyard facing south, you might want to just have a higher wall in the backyard, a trellis uh, that creates a full shade between the, um, between the transom window and the main sliding door or window below. And again, uh, because the wall is higher, you have a deeper penetration of daylight into the space. What happens is when we don't even integrate these opportunities, uh, this is a home in Florida with all the blinds drawn. Again, there's nothing you could do uh, if the sun's gonna be beating in all days. And most people wind up just not even adjusting the blinds. They just leave them closed all the time. And in contrast, there's a house I did in Chico, California back in the early 80s, and every window shaded, and um, and again, tremendous amount of thermal mass, and the house just is incredibly natural comfort. Uh, the Q skylights are not skylights, they're actually batch solar water heaters. And again, thermal storage can be integrated in lots of easy ways. Uh, it, could be, um, uh, it could be the floor, it could be a tile, or some other a ceramic surface, uh, you, you can have fireplaces with stone veneer, counters can be stone as well. There's lots of ways of getting lots of storage. And you need about five square feet of thermal mass for every one square feet of that south facing window to buffer that heat and, and save it for the nighttime. Okay, I'm gonna take a break. Mike, is Ben here from Jinko? I do not see him in the list, so I would go ahead and carry on. Okay, carry on. Maybe we'll, if he's here at the end, we'll put him in. Okay, moving on to the next best practice, or next strategy, rather, right sizing. We have two key best practices for how we uh, get the most out of, out of space we built. One is to optimize the space. And that's the geometry of the floor plan, eliminating rooms we don't need, combining rooms so they live bigger together, Minimal but generous circulation. You want the least circulation you have, but you don't want it to be um, uh, a negative experience. So sometimes adding light or a slightly greater width is worth doing. Indoor-outdoor linkage, as we mentioned, built-in furniture is a great way to optimize space. It just it, uh, adds about effectively 20, 30 percent additional space uh, in perception, and I'll show show you why in a moment. And the details make an incredible difference. Uh, varying ceiling heights, quality trim, hardware finishes, <laughs> expert colors, expert lighting, all those things create a perception of a bigger space. So the big concept would be similar to the car industry. If you look at the bloated, incredibly oversized cars we built in the early 1970s, they were the epitome of non-right sizing. Uh, just m way more spacing needed uh, for storage, for engines, for comfort inside that car. And uh, the pressure of the imported cars, which were much smaller and much more effectively designed, uh, eventually forced the American car industry to follow suit and build right-sized cars. So if you look at a 2020 Chevy Impala versus a 1970 Chevy Impala, 50 years difference, you have maybe three feet less wheelbase, but you have the same or more uh, leg room and head room and trunk space. Um, you have more efficient, more productive engines. You have far more safe car with crumple zones and better braking and seat belts and airbags. Everything about the experience driving the car is better. And it's so right size compared to the bloated uh, product we used to build 50 years ago. And I'm gonna suggest that you uh, so our last presentation we did about uh, the future of housing and that we have to move towards more affordable housing 
right sizing is an amazing strategy for doing that. So we mentioned geometry is one opportunity, and you can see here why you have a two 1500 square foot footprint configurations for homes, 160 by 25, 137 and a half by 40 feet. And you wind up with 170 linear feet of wall and foundation on the rectangular floor plan versus 155 linear feet. Now, on top of that, when you have a long, narrow floor plan, you need more hallway to navigate and get through from front rooms to back rooms. And you have less daylight, you have less exposure in the front and back where most of the windows are. So everything's better about the square floor plan. And if you look at the cost for uh, framing walls and for foundations, it's about uh, almost $650 savings in costs for the 15 linear feet of wall and foundation you don't build. These prices are pretty old. I would suspect today it's closer to $2,000 savings building a square or square type of footprint versus rectangular and it gives you almost two times the views to the front and back. And because you have about 10% less wall exposure to the outside conditions, you have about 10% energy savings. So this is just in every way is a better configuration. Uh, now, the, the planning process has to accommodate these footprints. So sometimes I accept you're stuck with what you're stuck with and you have to use a uh, rectangular configuration. Uh, we said uh, also to eliminate rooms you don't need. Often uh, today, very common, the dining room, formal dining room. It's such a little utilized room. It's been cut very often from uh, modern floor plans that we build today. Uh, there's some other rooms that we, we cut in terms of, um, uh, uh, I'm trying to think, the other big rooms. Well, mainly the dining rooms are what is a big culprit for, for where we have savings. And, and then when we combine rooms together, the whole perception of the space just lives larger. Everything just lives larger when we do this. Now, there is a little bit of a um, commentary going on that we're maybe moving back to more compartmentalized floor plans. I would encourage everyone not to believe that so much. Um, COVID created a a uh, little bit of a movement there because people wanted spaces to uh, separate uh, in the event that uh, COVID hit a household. Um, open rooms, just, spaces just live larger. And I believe uh, the, the, sh the small trend to compartmentalization will be short-lived if it was much at all. Uh, Indoor-outdoor linkages, I can't emphasize enough. Um, uh, we've been advocating this starting with retooling for about 15 years. And I keep saying, uh, this is one of the most valuable spaces you can provide uh, for homes. And uh, now the data backs it up. 87% uh, of homeowners surveyed uh, investing more in outdoor living in 2022. Uh, they just want to get more out of their property. So this is, should be a no brainer. And the outcomes are always pretty amazing when they're done, done well. So really integrating outdoor living and then having the linkages from inside to outside so there's a natural flow will make the whole house live bigger because it's like you have all this additional living space visually, the outdoor living space that's now part of your indoors. Another big one is uh, um, built-in storage uh, or built-in furniture. I get a lot of um, slack about this one uh, because Builders are reluctant to put this in, but I'll tell you right now um, that in absence of a lot of good, thoughtful storage, uh, your households will be, a cell will be living with clutter. And clutter is a huge negative user experience. Uh, the psychological effects are stress and increased cortisol levels that can become chronic, inability to focus that kills productivity. And this is from the prestigious Mayo Clinic findings they did on research. Uh, but we all know this. We don't need the scientific evidence. We all know clutter is just a stressor. And so if we don't solve it for the residents moving in and we just have models that have no real life um, uh, uh, connection to how we actually will use the home and load them up with lots of stuff that we own, then the 
home buyers who move into our homes will have a lower experience and satisfaction with us when we build those homes. So there's uh, a, a, also a, a compelling business case for why to do built-ins just in terms of the demographic shift that was buying homes, everything from um, millennials down to Gen Z. Uh, one, that the younger demographics and the millennials aren't so young anymore believe in a sharing economy. They don't want to own a lot of stuff. There's this insanity of moving that I call the process of what really happens when we move our furnishings and how much compared to how much they're actually worth. The cost of moving can easily see the value of the furniture. And then homes will live about 20 to 30 percent bigger if you effectively integrate built-ins. More about that in a moment. And then the lower costs. Uh, uh, the, if, if, this, if in fact the space lives 20 to 30 percent bigger and you can design a home with 20 to 30 percent less conditioned space, the hard cost savings from the smaller right-sized home with the built-ins will more than offset the cost of the built-ins. So it will be a lower cost solution. And the options include window seats, entertainment centers, uh, shelving desks, dressers, closet storage, hutches, drop zones, uh, mudroom storage, garage storage. There's just a whole host of things we could do to make homes live better. And the concept of why you get that perception of so much bigger space with built-ins is uh, evident with these two pictures. On the left is a piece of furniture, and you see you have waste of space on either side of the furniture. Because of the baseboard moldings, you have to pull the furniture off the wall, so you have the air gap between the furniture and the wall, and sometimes things can fall off the back, and it's hard to access the outlets, and, and you don't use a floor-to-ceiling height. In contrast, if you look at a built-in hutch, in this dining room, you have all this incredible amount of storage across the entire wall, floor to ceiling shelving or displays. You have um, just so much more value. I also call attention to the window seat. Uh, with, again, ample storage for big things where we don't normally know what where to put them, like blankets or or, or a lot of uh, uh, tablecloths for the uh, dining room, whatever it may be, there are so many things that would benefit from this kind of storage. And the dining room now just feels bigger because of the built-ins. Now, closet storage is a one of the sure things I can promise 100% of your buyers would want. In contrast to the typical closet on the left with a little bit extra investment on the right, this is about a $400 unit retail for uh, at Lowe's. I assume builders can get it for much less. But you know, just to start optimizing storage so your buyer experience is so much better, has such big dividends. And of course, I think um, bigger closets, uh, often this is an uh, extra upgrade, but we should figure ways to find solutions that are more uh, standard, and if it has to be an upgrade, uh, charge as little as we can charge so that our buyers just love our homes. You know, sometimes we don't have to just gouge them on every upgrade. If we can install an upgrade that makes them so much more happy with us as a builder, uh, this is one you want to do it. Then you want to just steal waste space and convert it into a huge uh, asset from a small asset. So a great example here is under stair space that was converted to a beautiful work at home center. So just the closet that would normally be under a staircase might be worth a thousand dollars a whole work at home center i would estimate might be worth fifteen thousand i just added fourteen thousand dollars of value to that space under the stair i'm pretty confident i can build this unit for under fourteen thousand dollars net profit and also we have to just be really good at curating trim and optimizing trim for buyers one of the things that we have to really rethink as a building industry is loading up models of everything buyers would love to have, only to have them have to just keep cutting back and not ha knowing how to package everything to fit a budget. I think we have to curate choices for various price points so people don't get this huge frustration when they buy homes. It's insane that they get so financially stressed as they currently are. So we could have curated trim packages and hardware packages and appliance packages and just the way the car industry has an EX, an LX, and limited edition, let's say, for a, uh, a specific model car, 
you can have an EX and LX and a limited edition options for your homes and you keep people in the right curated choices that are expertly curated uh, by great interior architects who know how to get the most for the least cost. And color adds value. Here's a, here was a study done by Zillow um, uh, where they essentially looked at over 30,000 photos from homes and able to do a correlation to show that color was worth as much as $5,400 difference between homes that had expert color and those that didn't. So again, it makes spaces feel bigger and it adds value. And expert lighting makes spaces feel bigger and it's, well, it's something you're gonna have to think about as an industry because the new advanced lighting technologies bring so many capabilities. And if we can start mass customizing homes and have solutions like this don't cost as much because they're being used over and over again, Again, we have tremendous cost savings. And again, expert lighting is transformational. Uh, my new, one of my good friends just built a house and you go in and you have, with the smart control technology, any mood you wanna set, various color options. This is where the industry is going. And we have to figure out at various price points, how do we integrate uh, ones that are sensitive to that price point and optimize the experience so just when we apply all this stuff, you know, this is just one example of many, we're leveraging space. We have open plans, we're eliminating or combining rooms, we're minimizing circulation space that has the least value. We're using built-ins to create so much uh, more effective space and getting, getting rid of clutter. And then we're enhancing space with indoor, outdoor linkages with varied ceiling heights, quality trim, hardware finishes, colors and lighting. So all this just kind of works together. And here's an example of a floor plan I'm going to show you multiple times. I did in the 80s for um, a, a project we were doing with the utility company. But this is a 1,400 square foot floor plan I would submit with like 1,800 square feet, three bedroom, two baths, compartmentalized bath, luxury suites, um, huge amount of kitchen counters and um, islands and so forth. And uh, I figure the 400 square feet at $250 a square foot is about $100,000 savings by knocking off 400 square feet I didn't have to build. Next is simple. And I love this quote from Leonardo da Vinci, simplicity is the ultimate sophistication. And you see it in Europe all the time. Now this happens to be when cities uh, went to, on a trip to Italy, Portofino. Uh, but I love the picture because we often think European architecture so impressive because it's so ornate, complex, and it's just the opposite. These are just flat walls, and what's making the buildings and streets and the architecture exciting is uh, a rhythm, a, a texture of color, trim, and indoor, outdoor living. It, it just, all the principles work. Simple is a unique approach to saving cost and delivering a better experience. But, uh, the three um, top tier best practices are optimized the floor plan, the exterior, and the interior. And then more granular, it's about footprint and the functionality of the footprint. It's the geometry and the functional architectural features, and then authentic trim color and details. And then on the interior, it's finishes and details again. So uh, I love this uh, recent uh, study, again, Stuff we've been saying for 15 years just coming to uh, roost as in terms of finally people accepting it. The number one must have for home buyers this year is simplicity. 80 plus percent of nearly 1,700 Americans between ages 21 and 75 wanted more simple designs. Okay, this, this is a Harris poll, but you know, we just feel we have to load way too much complexity. So just to show what happens when I just do one recess in a design, uh, how it adds costs and no additional value. So if I wanna have a recess in this footprint, uh, 12 foot in and 16 foot across for kind of a, a porch that I can sit under the house roof from the second floor, I've added two 12 foot walls that I don't have with just a square design. Because to go in 12 feet, I had, I had to have two walls 12 feet and two foundations. So that's $2,600 of additional costs just to do the recess pocket. And I wind up with 200 less square feet than if I just kept it square. 
and I would just reinvest that money into a much nicer porch on the front of the house. So it's simple, looks better, it saves more money, it's always the better way to go. So here's that design I just showed you that was uh, 1,400 square feet that lives like 1,800 square feet. And I compare it to another three bedroom, two bath design. That's probably about a 2,000 square foot, 2,200 square foot home. But one has 15 corners. Uh, the simple one on the right has six corners. Nine more corners at $1,500 a corner is $13,500 just for the complexity that was added that I don't believe adds any value. Same thing in kitchen designs when you get to your footprint on your inside the homes. You now, corner cabinets to me are always deadly. You know, it's hard to get to the corner high cabinet at all. And so you can do an angle cabinet or figure something out. A lot of times the corner has some more expensive uh, lazy Susan or, or it's just dead. I've seen some builders just give up the corner. And in contrast, on the right, what we do is simply move the pantry that's outboard on the left to next to the refrigerator and it creates a framed space for the refrigerator, creates a much more useful pantry, it creates more counter space. Everything's better when it's simple. <coughs> and also I just here two pictures of homes, both from uh, manufacturer ads. And the one on the left is stunning in terms of the complexity of what its, what its roof really has got to do. I always ask um, kids in, lectures about just trying to make housing and architecture simple. What's the purpose of a roof? And even they get it, it's the shed weather. And the roof on the left versus the roof on the right has incredibly co additional complexity and costs involved in it for less functionality, tremendous additional costs in the future to maintain and replace it. It's just simple and authentic is better. Uh, in my neighborhood, uh, I go crazy when I see facade architecture, in this case, a brick front and then the vinyl siding, and go just, what you could do is just, like many homes have in our neighborhood, just use one siding, don't have a fake front, and reinvent the savings in the masonry into a front porch the way this homeowner did. So it's about using your money more wisely. The brick is like an advertisement. This is the cladding I can't afford on all four sides. I wish I could, but here it is on the front versus the authentic home on the right, which also has better color and better trim that costs no more, is just thoughtful selection of the, uh, of the siding and then all the additional resources to build the front porch. So just wrapping up simple, footprint, geometry, function, authentic, they're obvious when they're done right. Of course, there's a lot to do with proportion and, then, and just attention to detail, but Simple is a huge cost saver just waiting for you. And the last um, strategy for design today is integrated systems. And the three uh, key best practices, the infrastructure systems, the actual building structure, HVAC, plumbing, electric, the livability, which is the furniture, the storage, lighting, water protection. And yes, furniture is a system. And if I ever see floor plans without furniture layout, I just send them back. I don't want to see them until I can see the furniture. And then technology is just creeping up on us as a new system that's a must-have. So the solar system and smart home capabilities have to be integrated in, into design as well. So on structure, you know, there's no more cost to, to do a roof that's 4.8, 4 in 4 12 versus 5 in 12, and that will save you cutting an extra piece of of uh, OSB sheathing on e either side of the ridge, why don't we be thoughtful and actually design our homes for two foot dimensions, knowing all sheet good products come in four by dimensions? That could be thousands of dollars of savings. We talked about that Walsh construction project in Portland, Oregon, 124 4th and Nash. I'll give you a few examples to show how they save 24% cost. First, they went from uh, two by uh, four framing, 16 on center, uh, to uh, two by six framing, 24 inches on center. And that saved them 42% reduction in framing material. Now the same thing happened on their uh, interior floor sheathing, on their interior walls, they did this throughout. They just optimized for two foot dimensions. 
And then on the outside, they wound up with all this extra insulation, a 16% increase in the whole wall R value. And then they wound up with 25% less sheathing because less waste cutting, everything was sized for the sheathing, all the dimensions were designed for it. So with zero impact on the design, they wound up with about 24% savings just by optimizing design for structure. And then here's one where thinking about structure at the very initial concept phase of your design, you can go, well, why even do a traditional basement design? Let's say this is a cold climate home. I can trade off that basement with a shallow frost detected footing and, can, and use SIP as a structure instead of trusses. And I have all that upper level space volume where the attic used to be with a frame construction. And now I've traded off a basement for an upper level, which might be worth $100 to $150 a square foot more because it's an above level space. And the savings are pretty impressive, up to $6,000 going from a conventional basement to a uh, 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 to shallow frost protected footing. Uh, on the either end of the gable walls, you're now getting function out of it. It's a wall for your living space. So that's, that wall framing is free. It's $1,000, $2,000 of framing because it already was there. The egress windows you don't have to build to get out of the basement per code might be one or 2,000. All the air ceiling and air barriers at the attic ceiling interface might be one or 2,000. All the attic venting you don't need, ridge and soffits, gable vents, one or one and a half thousand. All the waste that you save, there's so much less waste building with the SIP system and about time three four or five days might be worth one and a half two and a half thousand and if, if the eight thousand square feet on the upper level is now worth a hundred dollars more or hundred dollars more there's another sixty thousand to a hundred thousand dollars of extra value just because the above grade space is so much better living so this is how the the numbers can add very quickly in terms of more cost effectiveness I mentioned I don't want to see a floor plan without furniture, so a good friend of mine built this project in uh, Libertyville, Chicago. It's a very narrow site, so he had to do a narrow footprint, but he built nice indoor outdoor living pockets and design. But the furnishing tells me it lives really well. However, when I get to his second floor, over here, I'm a little crazy because I don't know where to put a dresser in this room because the sliding door is right down, down against the edge where the walk-in closet in. So I move the sliding door and turn the bed so it has a better view to the outdoor deck. I now get much more storage. I get two dressers where I had none. Just by turning the bed 90 degrees, I realize how much more function I get out of space and how it lives better. And the other bedroom, it's insane that the door is on that side because I have such a tiny dresser way uh, below what it should be for that room. I moved the door to the other side. Now I get a full dresser. But this is just only going to happen if we're just really diligent about kind of looking at furnishing as a whole design uh, um, strategy and really getting the house to, to live as well as it can. Get rid of wasted space, lost functionality, simpler construction. Uh, this is a storage system in my car. I'm not going to go through all these things, but I made a list. That's just what I do. And I'm stunned to realize how little there is in homes. So I've developed a storage system for homes. Um, this is uh, a basic list. It's in the, it's in the ha Housing 2.0 reference book. I'm not going to go through all these. But essentially, there's so many storage needs we, your buyers have for bedrooms, for cleaning, for entertainment, for work, for drop zones, and garages. And if you don't provide it, the chances are they'll do a at best a modest job with a lot of clutter as a result. So here's an example of the drop zone, which is you know, nice to see this finally come to awareness as, a, uh, as an important feature in new homes, so a place to put all your, your keys and uh, uh, mail and your jackets and your boots. And it's just a place most houses would love to have. It would again, super enhancement to the user experience. And then we know people need storage for cleaning, for vacuums and mops and brooms and cleaning supplies. And we know in laundry rooms, people need places to hang clothes and for uh, all the, again, the cleaning supplies and other needs. 
So if we provide it, uh, it'll live better. If we don't, then it again be clutter. And lighting is so important and is a very, uh, again, complete difference when it's done with an expert versus done just by homeowners themselves. So in the design process, we have to think through ambient, task, accent lighting, and more and more, this will have to be integrated with the smart home strategies that are absolutely uh, here to stay. So all this has to be done. And when we think of advanced lighting, you just have to know that the capabilities are going to the roof. And if you're not tracking and thinking about how you integrate them, um, someone else will. And it's a question of not being left behind. And outdoor lighting is transformative. This is, uh, this is like 80 watts, 90 watts of LED lights. And what it does to the house is incredible. And think what it does to a whole neighborhood if you're a builder building subdivisions. So this, again, you can't be an afterthought. Lighting needs to really be thought through. So let's wrap up with uh, just applying. Hold oh, one second. Wrap up in a few minutes. Okay, can you hear me, Mike? Yep, you're sounding good, Sam. Okay, great. So we're in the home stretch here. Let's just look look at what it um, might look like if we apply all these best practices. And what again I want to do is go back to the how of housing two of housing two point and the process. Uh, the first thing we do is we invest in user experiences that are transformative. And so we may have to add some cost for experts and those features. And so that might be the design views with landscaping and hardscaping. It could be choosing low maintenance, regionally appropriate materials, building front porches, and uh, adding features that help a home lift bigger, uh, varying the ceiling heights, outdoor living, built-in furniture, expert lighting, quality, quality finishes and trim. But the next part is to then optimize value by extracting all these cost saving opportunities or zero cost opportunities. So on the top of the best practices that are free, optimizing views is just a matter of just getting the most of the natural views that you have. Um, natural comfort costs no more. If we just are a little bit thoughtful in the community planning process and taking advantage of lots we have that face the back north, south or the front south. Natural heating and cooling, natural light, natural fresh air. Optimizing drainage is a must. You don't want to have a home buyer with a wet basin problem. That will be a completely dissatisfied home, homeowner for the life of their time in your house. You want to live bigger with optimized footprints, optimized layouts, and expert colors. None of this costs more. And there are all these best practices that cost less, right sizing with less square feet, simple, integrated systems, and mass customization we spoke about last week, really leveraging your investment <coughs> in expert solutions that you use over and over again. So with this in mind, I'll show you an example how it might be applied with this um, 1,400 square foot home we showed you earlier. Again, I want to call out that it has a, a tremendous amount of counter space in the kitchen, a, in, a, a dining space, it has um, a, a living space as well, a very luxurious master suite with tubs and showers and compartments for toilets and master closets and tremendous amount of storage, compartmentalized bathrooms so two can use it in the hallway, bedrooms with dressers and desks and full featured laundry room. And so it addresses all five strategies, fit to site, natural comfort, right sizing, simple and integrated systems. So first on fit to site, we have optimized design views that are off the page, uh, thus both the view windows and landscaping and hardscaping. There's optimized drainage, optimized regionally appropriate materials in a very hot climate. We had UV resistant siding, UV resistant roofing and fire resistant roofing, which was unique at the time. Most homes in California for which this was designed were using Need a shake roofing at the time, which was like putting kindling in a roof, which was a stunning design choice back then. And then we optimized community connection with a full featured front porch and a rear garage not shown. 
And then on natural comfort, right, we went with that approach where we raised the back elevation that was facing south, so the light can go as deep into the space as it could. We used SIP roofs that you see here to create a natural high ceiling, and then we lowered a portion of it for storage and mechanical that I'll show you later. But in natural comfort, you had the solar orientation set south to the back, the cool roof and future solar space. You have the overhang and trellis size to control the seasonal sunlight. You have the summer sun shaded and the winter sun able to come through and heat the thermal mass flooring. And you had that summer breeze ventilation that go through the house. And you had wing walls to shade the sun in the morning and afternoons. So essentially, this was a comprehensive natural comfort home with thermal mass control as well. On right sizing, we had an open layout, minimal circulation. All these built-ins throughout the house that just will make it so clutter-free and live so much bigger. Even though the bedrooms are small, they had oversized dressers with full floor to ceiling shelving above the dresser, and then workspaces with desks. And then, um, you know, you can, the reason why the room's small, it's gonna live so much bigger. And uh, then we have varied ceiling heights. We mentioned with the natural SIP roof configuration and the flat port in the middle for mechanical and for storage right there. And then we have indoor outdoor linkages. And the result is again, about 400 square feet of savings worth about $100,000 in estimation. And then integrated systems and structure, the SIP roofs and walls, two-foot dimensions, simple roof, mechanical electrical, there's compact HVAC and condition space, compact plumbing, smart home, EV ready, battery ready. Furniture was optimized for flow, minimized wasted space, storage, extensive built-ins, generous closets, attic storage, and solar south-facing roof with no vents. And the design began as this more complicated design and went to this design. So it went from 1,480 to 1,380 square feet. So, uh, and we got a bigger front porch, a larger kitchen, and a private workspace. And we saved 100 square feet, it's simple geometry, eight foot less lot width, six less corners, no kitchen corner cabinet, and mass customization. We took this whole section and repurposed it over for this design. So here's how these numbers add up. You know, on fifth of site, the views are worth about $10,000. In my estimate, the front porch is about $10,000 of value. The natural comfort, 30-year savings, uh, estimated about $20,000 for the smaller house. The better views, uh, comfort, daylight, fresh air, about $20,000. Right sizing, the clutter-free living, about $25,000. The 400 square feet at $100,000. Six less corners at $10,000. Uh, standard kitchen and bath with no corners and simple design, about 10,000 less. The structure savings, I calculated 2,500, the compact HVAC, 1,000, compact plumbing, 1,000, plus with all the instant hot water, the fixtures in the, in the bathrooms, about $1,000. Not having to wait for hot water. And the future ready for solar, about 15,000. That you would, uh, you would save just uh, from not having to uh, do any changes. So uh, just without adding it up directly, but just taking conservative numbers, it's about 120,000 of savings and $100,000 of added value. So numbers are big with optimization. And it leaves me with these recommendations. One, everyone should look at the framework in Housing 2.0 as a, a placeholder. It's what I was able to curate from decades and decades of having this privilege to travel across the entire country and then 20 years of experience as a residential architect to just collect all the best practices I could. It doesn't mean that they're for everyone or that uh, you have to embrace them all. You have your own preferences based on a tolerance for change or, or demographics, marketing conditions, climate conditions. You should at least Look at them as a sample of what you could do, add, delete, come up with your own framework. Because once you have a framework that you embrace as your, as your framework for your product, you have a brand. This is what your home experience, this is a user experience your homes will consistently deliver. You have a whole story to tell. Invest in the experts to apply that customized optimization framework, architecture, interior design, 
color, lighting, technology, landscaping. Extract substantial cost savings by minimizing waste, complexity, optimizing integrated systems. Invest at least a portion of savings in transformational user experiences, views, storage, built-ins, outdoor living, and explore mass customization and systems built options. And you know, over time, Mike and I had, do set up these action groups that work together. If you're ever interested, um, do put yourself on the list, and over time, we'll um, uh, we'll consider setting another one of those up. So that's basically the design module, Mike. I'll let you wrap it up. Well, Sam, we're fortunate enough to have Ben here with us, and so. Um, Ben can uh, can speak a little bit to Jinko and some of the things that they can do. So uh, very quickly, thank you for having me on here. Um, really appreciate the time to come and speak. Uh, again, my name is Ben Malar. I'm the director of business development for Jinko Solar, um, and I have had a focus throughout a lot of my career of working with home builders. Uh, particularly on how to get their kind of best bang for their buck for the return that they are able to give to their homeowners and to themselves. And I say return, that means just generally benefits. And so I worked with a home builder for a while, worked in a, a purchasing department of Pulte Homes, and then made my way into green building and uh, into solar. And so really happy to, to be here to talk to you. Uh, Jinko is a large uh, solar manufacturer, and to just put that into color, they have a capacity of 110 gigawatts of solar. The Three Gorges Dam in China uh, is 22 uh, gigawatts of energy, so um, pretty big company. But I, I do want to get into a couple of things. I'm going to skip forward here in terms of some some benefits to solar and why builders should be starting to think about it even more than they have in the past. Um, one of them, and Sam showed this here, is that there is a real quantifiable value uh, for homeowners um, and therefore then to the builder as well of building solar. And that's the value of either the savings or the value of the increased appraised value that we've started to see uh, borne out. There's another value though, particularly when you get in storage, uh, that is uh, providing kind of this, a resilient home and energy secure home. Uh, I live here in Florida uh, where we don't have frequent uh, kind of brownouts and, and power loss, but we do have frequent hurricanes. And so we see so many people uh, and even some builders deciding to, to have energy storage as well as solar connected to their homes to give them a, a clean source of renewable energy. And that means it gets renewed. You don't have to go to the gas station and continually get gas to feed a generator, uh, but you actually get to harvest the sun over and over again. And so builders are starting to see that homeowners are, are wanting that. They see that homeowners want generators quite often, um, but they've started to say, well, there, there may be a better way to get them power. Um, uh, there's an opportunity as well, uh, homeowners, uh, to make your homeowners kind of proud of their homes. Uh, we see homeowners that have smart features as well as uh, good energy uh, uh, features. They, they become a little bit more proud and sometimes brag about their home a little bit more. Um, but there's a, there's a benefit to, uh, to solar for builders if they want to and that is to control the look of their communities. Uh, when I worked with a builder, many times we were very, very concerned about the look and what, what was the unit going to look like, right? So we did control for how the landscaping looked, what the entrances looked like, what, what the lighting looked like. Um, but if, you know, what we'll see is that somebody goes solar every 48 seconds in the US, what will happen in many cases is if, if you don't do the whole job in the beginning, uh, then somebody else comes back behind you and does it not as well. And that goes to what Sam was talking about with uh, spaces and making sure people have room for, uh, you know, dropping the things or, or storing the things that they need to. People will come through and do maybe not as good of a job uh, of getting things installed. So you can actually, as a builder, control the look of the um, 
systems that get installed by deciding to install them themselves or having a post-close program where you have allotted uh, an area on the roof and certain designs that can happen even uh, post-close and by making sure that you've got the correct electrical connections uh, up front in the right conduit so you can hide things and make things look really good. Uh, that's incredibly important to builders is the aesthetics, uh, but it also is important to homeowners and you can show a really sleek looking home um, that you know powers itself. That is a that is a big deal. And many times by implementing solar inside of your building process, there's a good chance that you won't lose any days of production. You won't have any large uh, delays in what you have to do because there's a minimum amount of things that you need to do in order to uh, make solar work. And obviously for, for a lot of builders that, that can lead to, to more profit. Um, so kind of a real quick and easy way to think of things. Uh, if you're a builder out there, you can implement solar as, either as a pre-close uh, installation process or even a post-close installation process. As Sam pointed out, uh, you can have a pre-planned uh, roof area, uh, free of vents. You can have a conduit run from the electric panel to the attic uh, or even up to the roof uh, so that any sort of things or any electricals hidden within the structure of the home. Um, and then once you've done that, you could either market this kind of solar ready home or market a solar home if you're actually having the panels then installed during uh, construction and get that marketing benefit um you know what i would suggest is if, if you're going to work with a, a group like uh, jinko would hey, work with one of our preferred install partners and then just we'll you know we'll provide design engineering marketing material and even buyer consults if needed again keeping the the lifting the heavy lifting uh from you but uh, at the end of the day, you end up providing a lot of value to your homeowners, potentially raising the um, uh, uh, price of your own homes and or uh, being able to get kind of referral fees at the same time. So there's a lot of benefits there. Um, I wanted to talk through that quickly because I didn't want to take up too much time, uh, but there are some, some definitely uh, big benefits now uh, to go ahead and controlling the look of your homes, um, and planning things out from the beginning uh, as you're thinking about building homes. Uh, it is crucially important to keep costs down and to add value to your homeowners. With that, I'm just going to be quiet from there. All right. Well, thank you, Ben. I uh, appreciate it. And actually, uh, don't go anywhere because I do have a question for you. Um, uh, one of our audience members, Zoran, wanted to know, if solar panels and battery storage is the new normal. Um, so I'll let you answer that one first, and then he's got a follow-up question to that. Yeah, absolutely. So I wish it was the new normal. We're almost there, right? So depending on the location that you're in, if you're in California, I would say that could be a new normal. Um, but in other places, it's not normal yet, right? It's It's something that you're adding value to, and you may be... Uh, one of a few or two or three of a few uh, builders in your area to implement. And right, so there is still room to say, hey, uh, we're doing something better for our homeowners. And I think there's something to that. You know, I hope one day it becomes like the Energy Star program where everybody says, hey, I've got, we have Energy Star homes, right? We, everybody has to say it. Uh, that's not where we're at right now, but uh, there is tremendous marketing value saying that we've done something better. For our homeowners. All right. And then uh, I know Zoran's up in Canada. And so his question is Does solar make sense in some northern locales like Canada? It can. It produces a lot less power um, uh, per kind of square foot of panel, if you think of it that way. So it's going to depend a little bit on your um, cost of energy, if you're thinking simply uh, economically. So it's gonna depend on your utility energy. Um, and then it also depends on how long somebody was maybe living in the home and depends on the type of energy you have. So if you're gonna live there a long time and the utility currently burns coal, 
uh, you may want to still have solar because it is a renewable source of energy. You may want to have energy and uh, uh, solar in storage if you are subject to some level of blackouts. Or you may want to have some sort of solar in storage if you have a very variable um, time of use or demand type pricing that you're able to kind of play a little bit of arbitrage. So it can make sense. Uh, it wouldn't be the place that I look to and say that's where you've got to put it, right? Um, but it can make sense depending if you're meeting the needs and desires of your specific clients. It's easier down in uh, Florida where you can say, yeah, this is going to give you an economic value right away. But there are other considerations to make other than just the economic value. Uh, but that is where a lot of the main main drivers are. Okay. And then one more follow-up to the economic part of it. Now he was wondering about, do you advise people to uh, try and negate their entire consumption to basically go to try a, a zero energy system? Or is it, you know, does it, I think there's other factors that typically come into play, right? Like, are you credited on your bill at retail or at wholesale? Um, can you talk a little bit about some of those uh, economic aspects of it? Yeah, so so let's say the, the reason that somebody is going solar is, is purely the economic, right? Well, then it will certainly uh, depend on your utility, whether you have net metering or whether they're kind of uh, letting you subsidize their uh, grid um, uh, and, that, and only giving you a certain or half credit for the energy that you send to them. Um, so that does matter. Uh, but let's just play the game of, of, let's say you get full credit for the energy that you produce and send to them, um, which they then sell, send, uh, sell to your neighbor. Um, if that is the case, then yeah, getting enough solar to power your whole home is great, but it's going to depend on your roof size, which is if you're a builder, if you can, you know, look a little bit at that without creating extra waste, that's fantastic. It's going to depend on where the location of your um, uh, uh, clear spaces are, whether it's east, south, uh, west. You typically don't want to have them face north. Um, but what I would tell you is even if you can't get, well, first, if you're building well, you've built a home that doesn't use a ton of energy, right? You're thought about the energy consumption. And so many homes can get to 80 to 100% of the energy. That is a cute dog. Um, but if you don't, let's say you're only able to get 60% of your energy and harvest your own energy. Uh, I look at that a few ways. One, if somebody told me that I can go to the grocery store and get 15% off of 60% of my groceries, I would take it, right? Um, secondarily, uh, I don't know if you guys garden any, but if you've grown anything successfully, I haven't done much successfully, but if you've grown anything, um, there is this great feeling for being able to provide for yourself um, even when you can't provide all the vegetables you you consume, right? Um, being able to provide for yourself and get a, getting maybe even a discount on that energy for part of it is a huge deal. And if you are using it for resiliency and energy security and adding storage, then obviously you want to be able to refuel your energy uh, energy from the sun. And so that's the way I've always thought about it. Most people, again, are in that 60 to 90% range. You can do 100 if you really thought things out in the beginning. But I typically wouldn't worry about, hey, I've got to get every last cent. I would, I would worry about, get, let's get most of the way there. And that's where a lot of the value is, particularly with the way people's rate structures work. Awesome. Well, thank you, sir. We really appreciate you joining us today. We thank you certainly, uh, Jinko, for their sponsorship. And if people have other questions for Ben, uh, go ahead and send them my way because I can always get them to Ben uh, via email. So thank you, Ben. We really appreciate it. Um, and Sam, uh, speaking of questions, we've got some questions for you as well. Um, so if you've got a couple minutes to uh, to take those. I, I can't hear you at the moment, but. If we can get Sam's audio working again. All right. Can we hear you, Sam? Try one time. 
There we go. Yep. All right. Okay, so we have uh, we have a handful of questions here for Sam. Um, uh, first, uh, let's let's take one from Zoran. Um, he wanted to know: uh, Can ceramic tiles over wood floor joists be considered thermal mass? <laughs> Not very good. Um, generally, you want about two inches of thickness is good from a mass. So if you have a if you have a thick set mortar uh, versus a thin set, then it will work. Um, what happens with thermal mass is you get about eighty percent of the benefit from those first two inches. There's a very big drop off in terms of the effective you know battery storage kind of functionality. So yeah, you could, but um, it would have to be a thick set. You know, you want some decent uh, amount of storage capacity. But um, even over a thin set, you get some benefit. But the full storage, again, about two inches is your sweet spot. All right. I had a question from David. He wanted to know, if you're framing 24 inches on center, uh, how, how does that affect uh, shear wall design? Well, you have to uh, basically engineer out the numbers. Essentially, it's going to be a lot of the shear comes from the uh, sheathing material itself. And if you have a wider stud, a two by six, two by six versus two by four, it may actually be stronger. So it all depends on um, the calculations. But generally, there's no problems with shear with two, uh, 24 inches on in center. Okay, very good. Um, Wanted to go back to a couple of other questions that Zoran had. Um, talking about windows, opening windows, is that going to uh, negatively impact indoor air quality if you have pollutants such as pollen or other allergens entering the home? And then there's another question about opening windows that I'll let you go with first on the IAQ angle. Absolutely. So you, you, you want to be conscious of, obviously you don't want to open windows during um, wildfire season event. You don't want to open windows if it's a heavy smog day or a heavy pollen count. So windows have uh, constraints, but it's, it, it's you know, during most conditions when you have cool night breezes, the air quality outside is generally very good. And it's, a, it's an amazing resource for cooling a space, bringing fresh air, uh, just kind of washing the whole house. Uh, but you do have to watch it. Of course, as we go to the southeast and the middle Atlantic and you have hot, humid conditions um, in the summertime, obviously it's not, it's not as effective to use outdoor air when the absolute, when one the most significant pollutant humidity is present. But it's a great feature to have on nice days when the outside air quality is good to be able to open the windows and have them designed and strategically set up to create either cross ventilation or side wall ventilate, no, front to side ventilation, whatever strategy you choose, fresh air is an amazing um, user experience. It feels great to have fresh air. I mean, he also has a question about the natural heating and cooling. Um, you know, if it's too hot or cold, well, uh, obviously, you know, you're going to want to try and maintain a certain temperature range in your home. Um, the fall and spring kind of seasons are usually when you can find some of that sweet spot. If it gets too hot or too cold, obviously Zoran's up in Canada. If it gets too cold, you don't want to have your windows open because you're just going to be freezing. But um, uh, I think you've talked a little bit about that there with your answer, Sam, about, you know, when you have really nice days, yeah, open it up and, and enjoy. Yeah, you have, in, in many climates, you have extended times, swing seasons, with at least a month on, uh, in the spring and the fall, where open, open windows is just the way to go. What you have in the western states is you have a very significant diurnal swing. So that where it may be 100 degrees, let's say in Sacramento, where I used to live during the day, it'll be 60 or below at night. So what we would do is we would open the windows and just thermally charge all the mass in the home, the drywall, the tile floors and concrete floors that we had, uh, counters, everything would just be charged all night long. The cool delta breeze would come in and the air conditioning wouldn't come on the next day until well late in the afternoon. You just had so much free cooling that you were charging 
and you had no significant latent load because we were out west. So the conditions were very, again, by climate and location, but almost everywhere I've lived, there are just always extended periods where pressure is by far when the house feels the best, when it's able to capture and just, just bring in that air. Um, spring and fall are just amazing times of year to have natural air. I go nuts when we just rely on the whole house ventilation is the only option. Of course, you need whole house ventilation, but um, I shut it down during spring and fall. Now, uh, this may be a little bit of a preview for an upcoming session, uh, seminar, but I'll ask it anyway. Um, Zara wanted to know, uh, do we need to simplify overcomplicated mechanicals or HVAC uh, systems? And if so, how? I think we might be covering this in, in maybe the <laughs> seminar. Yeah, we, we will. But it, it, that's a good question. I, I think the, the bigger challenge with systems, mechanical systems, HVAC systems, is with high performance homes for creating ultra load housing. And um, I think it's just, it's like having a finicky sport car. And we have to realize we need equipment that's really uh, so adaptable to this uh, ultra low loads. And so we have to move more and more to variable speed equipment. And so good variable speed equipment, high performance heat pumps are amazing opportunities for, for homes High performance homes because the um, just just the orientation alone could change the heat pump sizing requirements up to two tons. And do we really want to, or let's say we're building a subdivision, do we want to really have to have all these very uh, variations in sizes of equipment we have to order by house by orientation? Uh, variable speed equipment is going to be just able to throttle down, function efficiently, and you don't have to worry about the sizing nearly as much or hardly at all. And it's just um, a perfect solution. And the other thing that makes it also great in terms of design is it, it's a uh, footprint. High performance heat pumps have a smaller compressor outdoors and a lot of the designs and systems for distribution are easier to integrate in the design on the inside of the home as well. All right, well, we don't have any other questions, Sam. So I'm gonna go ahead and wrap up our second seminar and if you enjoyed that one there are still uh, four more you can attend um, our next seminar as uh, we kind of teased it a little bit there with that answer is going to take place three weeks from today that's on thursday march 7th that's going to be at our normal start time of 2 p.m eastern time as we mentioned we're going to be discussing performance but not just when it comes to energy efficiency so thank you so much for attending today. Thank you for all the wonderful questions. Thank you for the compliments. Um, thank you once again to our sponsors, Schneider Electric, Jinko Solar, Mitsubishi Electric, and Panasonic Healthy Indoor Living Solutions for their sponsorships of Housing 2.0. Until next time, I hope you all have a great President's Day weekend. Stay safe, stay healthy, and take care, everyone. So long.